Psalms chapter 9 verse 1 to 2 I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High.
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you because even at this time we know you are still in control. Over the past months, Lord, with so many of these problems concerning our health, our work, our life, Lord, we seem to stop somewhere. But we know you are calling us to give time and spend more time, invest the time with you. Lord, we have not been listening. We have not been talking with you. We have not been sharing our lives concern. We have not been enjoying your word. But we pray that the time that we have now is to be quiet. And thank you for your word, the Bible, that has so clearly teaching us what you want us to be, how you want us to live. And Lord, we pray that we will not only be the ones to be blessed by our knowing you, but that in this moment, Lord, when there are others who do not know you, may be filled with fear and anxiety, may our mouth, through your word, Lord, speak and testify your goodness that others too may be comforted. We cannot promise them anything, but we can promise them that you are still the Lord of Lords, the God of all things, and you are in charge, and you love us. Thank you in Jesus' name. Our scripture reading for today can be found in Romans chapter 9 verse 30 to Romans chapter 10 verse 13. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who do not pursue righteousness have attained it? That is a righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel who pursue a law that will lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith. But as if it were based on works, we have stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? That the word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if we confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who calls on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Shalom, brothers and sisters in Christ. Shall we all bow down in a word of prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father, as we come before you today, we praise you for your goodness, for your graciousness, for your mercies. Lord, your servant is an unworthy sinner, he is a worthless worm, and yet by your pure grace and mercy, you have chosen him to deliver your word. We ask that you anoint his lips, that he may declare your word faithfully to your people. We ask that you prepare the hearts of the people, 
that they may receive your word with gladness. All this pray in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Uh, before our message proper, I would like us to watch this short video for our introduction. Our topic for today is found in Romans chapter 9 verse 30 to chapter 10 verse 13. I entitled this sermon, So Near and Yet So Far. Like the athlete a while ago in the video, he was so near victory. He was so near the finish line. He was one of the first to reach the finish line and yet we all know that he is disqualified. Why? Because he did not compete according to the rules. He created his own rules and he did not jump over the hurdles. He ran through the hurdles and therefore that disqualified him. So near and yet so far. For the background of today's text, Paul in chapter 9, the earlier verses, reveals that not all bloodlines of Abraham, not everyone who has the blood of Abraham in him will be saved. And he also shockingly and scandalously revealed that some Gentiles will be saved. He also expounded on how God's mercy works, mainly that God will have mercy on whom he chooses to have mercy. Not based on who they are, not on their status, credentials, or what they have done. But it is only based according to His pure mercy. Our summary for today's message is that God has established a righteousness, a way of attaining righteousness according to faith in Jesus Christ. But the Jews rejected this righteousness and instead they establish their own righteousness that is to obey the law they would like to attain righteousness by obedience to the law on the other hand the gentiles who accepted the established rule of god concerning righteousness simply believe in what god wanted that is for everyone to believe to call on Jesus Christ as their Lord. And because of that, they are saved. Now, first, we have to understand God's righteousness. When God created Adam, he was perfect in every way. And because of that, he has a perfect relationship with God. All he needed to do was simply to remain in that relationship by obedience, complete obedience to God, and therefore maintain his perfection. But we all know that Adam sinned, and because of that, his relationship with God was broken, and their fellowship was broken. And therefore, Adam, representing mankind, needed to pay the penalty of their own sins. But because God wanted to restore that relationship with man, He established another way to attain righteousness. But He needed to deal with His justice. His justice demand that man should pay the penalty of his own sin. Paul in chapter 9 verse 30 says, What then shall we say? that the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith, but Israel who pursued a law of righteousness has not attained it. Paul begins his argument by stating that God established a righteousness, a way to restore his relationship with man, and that is by faith 
in Christ Jesus. This is God's only way of righteousness. But Paul states here that Israel rejected God's way of righteousness, God's established rule of righteousness. Instead, they sought to establish their own righteousness by pursuing the law. Now, we have a problem here because isn't it that God himself is the one who gave the law to the Israelites so that they may obey him? Now, what is the purpose of the law? The law is not a means of gaining righteousness. The design of the law is not for them to obey so that they can gain righteousness, not for gaining justification, but it is to reveal the character and the standard of God and also to regulate the moral, religious, and civil life of Israel as they live in the land. God has promised them. As Romans chapter 7 verse 13 tells us, Did that which is good then became the death of me? By no means. But in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it produced death in me through what was good, so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. Romans chapter 5 verse 20 the law was added so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Galatians chapter 3, verse 21. Is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But the scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner of sin so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we may be justified by faith. Again, the law was given by God to the Israelites not as a means of attaining righteousness but God wanted to use the law to show to the Israelites and to mankind how sinful we are, how utterly sinful we are, so that we would look up to Christ Jesus, His established righteousness for us, so that by believing in Jesus Christ, we may attain this righteousness. Now, we have to understand a certain theology called imputed righteousness. What is imputed righteousness? Well, when Adam sinned, his sin was passed on to us. All his descendants carried his sin. The Catholics call it the original sin. We simply call it the imputed sin, the passed on sin. So Adam's sin was imputed to every one of us such that we are all born sinners. And because we are sinners, we would die. The result of sin is death. And because we are all born sinners, we need to pay the penalty of our sins to satisfy the wrath of God, the justice of God. But God designed another way to satisfy His justice. And it is to send His Son, Jesus Christ, the perfect God-man, to die and pay the penalty of our sins. Jesus Christ, when He died on the cross, took all our sins and paid that penalty. And on the cross, Jesus declared, it is finished, tetelest time, meaning it is fully paid. He is able to pay for all our sins and because of that, satisfy the justice of God. And so, the righteousness of Christ, in the same way the sin of Adam was imputed, passed on to us, the righteousness of Christ is now passed on to everyone who would believe. It is imputed to everyone who would call on Him as Lord and Savior. Paul further states in chapter 10 verse 4, 
Christ is the end of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. The word end here is in Greek telos, meaning termination, the end of the matter, and also the end to purpose or fulfillment, meaning to that end. John MacArthur states it this way, it ends the sinner's futile quest for righteousness through his imperfect attempts to save himself by efforts to obey the law. So again, God has established a way of righteousness that can only be found by having faith in His Son, Christ Jesus, who died for all our sins. So the problem right now that Paul argues is that Israel rejected this righteousness, established righteousness of God. They did not submit to God's righteousness according to chapter 10 verse 3 they rejected the only solution God has established the only way his justice will be satisfied the only way we can be justified Christ Jesus paying the penalty for our sins satisfying the wrath of God not only did they reject God's established righteousness, they sought to establish their own righteousness according to verse 3. Since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. They invented and insisted on their own solution to their sin problem. In Chinese, we call this they pursued the law for righteousness. Chapter 9, verse 31, But Israel, who pursued a law of righteousness, has not attained it. Meaning, they work for their own salvation. They strive to obey the law, the commandments, to gain a righteous standing before God. But the problem as Paul argued earlier in chapter 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Furthermore, James chapter 2, verse 10 tells us, If I obey the whole law and yet I stumble in one point, I am guilty of all of it. The idea is that if man would only have one sin, he is already considered a sinner that, and he needs to pay the penalty of his own sin in hell. There are no amounts of obedience to good work or good works that would pay his sins. That is why we need Christ Jesus who is the one who paid all our sins when he died on the cross. You see, Israel persisted on insisting on being justified by the law. Then Paul pointed to them that Moses said, the one who does these things will live by them, according to verse 5. What does this mean? It means if they persist, if they insist to be justified by the law, then they have to obey it perfectly. They have to be perfect, obeying every command. And also, according to the law, they have to die according to its demand if they have not obeyed it perfectly. That means, if you choose to be justified by the law, then live according to it, then die according to the demand of the law. Furthermore, Paul reveals that in their hearts and in their minds, they're thinking that Somehow, they must ascend to heaven to bring Christ down or they must descend to the deep to bring Christ up according to verse 6 and 7. You see, the Israelites thought they should be good enough so that they could ascend to heaven and to bring Christ down or they should be good enough to be able to raise the Messiah up from the dead. You see, all these are works of God which He has already finished. 
God brought Christ down to save us and God also raised him from the dead victorious these are all the works of God and it is already done Paul also revealed that one of their problem is that they are zealous but not based on knowledge according to verse 2 chapter 10 for I can testify about them that they are zealous for God but their zeal is not based on knowledge Paul is speaking from his own experience in persecuting the believers he was zealous in trying to persecute and kill the Christians now zealousness and enthusiasm amounts to nothing if it is not based on the revealed truth or the knowledge of God the design the rules of God without first knowing and understanding the problem and situation our response might be futile and actually dangerous and a waste of effort especially when it comes to our eternal destiny again when we join a contest it would be wise for us first to understand all the set rules the set the established rules Paul is so sad to see how zealous the Israelites are where in fact all their efforts amounts to nothing in the same way when I look at the Catholics the Buddhist Tzu or the Iglesia de Cristo a lot of their members are so zealous in serving God and yet we all know according to God's revealed truth according to God's knowledge which is found in the Bible that they are worshiping the wrong God so their zealousness amounts to nothing and because of this what is the result of their rejection of God's established righteousness God's established rule for attaining salvation the result is that this salvation which is Jesus Christ the stone has now become their stumbling stone according to verse 33 it makes them fall they rejected the only solution given to them and actually it became their downfall the terminology Paul uses here is suggestive of a foot race they run zealously and stressfully only to stumble because they have not followed the rules the rule that God has established and because of this they did not attain righteousness or simply they are not saved all their efforts amounts to nothing that is how the Israelites responded to God's established way of righteousness but how did the Gentiles respond to this established righteousness again God established an easy solution for each one of us it says here that the word of faith is near us the word of faith is near you furthermore Paul tells us that everyone all and anyone who trusts believes by faith and calls on confess with our mouth and hearts that Jesus Christ is Lord will be saved now we have to understand the context here during their time they were under the rule of Caesar and Caesar is actually proclaimed as God and their Savior so people were demanded to confess that Caesar is Lord but the but the believers even at the cost of their lives publicly confess no Caesar is not our Lord Jesus Christ is Lord they may even die for what they believe in because of their profession but God promises that they will never be put to shame in verse 33 of chapter 10 and chapter 9 verse 11 
Now, having said that, yes, indeed, God has established an easy solution for us that anyone who would just simply believe in their hearts and with their mouth confess Jesus Christ is Lord would be saved. Having said that, I would like to clear things up. Now, I have encountered some people who believe that they are Christians, but clearly when, they, when you look at their lives, they're worse than unbelievers. But they would reason out to you that they have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. In fact, countless of times, back when they were still in Sunday school, back when they were still in grade school, when they were shared the gospel by their teachers. Some of these people may have been influenced by a teaching by Zane Hodges in his book called Absolutely Free, where it teaches that when you simply mouth out, by simply mouthing, Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior of my life, then you are a Christian, then you become a Christian and you are saved. Well, the important thing here is your real belief in your heart when you call on Christ Jesus as your Lord, when you accept it, when you believe in Him. In the same context that the Christians had back in their time, are you willing to die for your faith in Christ Jesus? Now, let me explain it this way. I've seen a lot of young people courting girls in high school or college, in their college days. You see, it's so easy to say those three words, I love you. But would you really believe that person who you, whom you have just met telling you I love you? Do you really believe that he would die for you? Do those words mean anything? Back in YGC, I had a friend who she was from Hope Christian High School. And one time I heard that someone was actually courting her and she became boyfriend, girlfriend with this person coming from Chiang Kai-shek. And when I realized who that person was, I warned her and I told her, you have to be careful with this person because he is the little brother of my classmate. From what I know, this person is exactly a carbon copy of his older brother, which is my classmate, who courts many, many girls at the same time. In Babaero. But she would reason out to me that he says he's a Christian. He's been to church. And I would tell her, not everyone who goes to church are Christians. And you really have to be careful. But again, puppy love. So she was not hearing anything I'm saying because she's madly in love with this person. So what I did was to contact her best friend. I called up the best friend and said, you have to warn your friend. What this best friend did was to call up the guy over the phone to be a phone pal. And lo and behold, this guy also courted the best friend, not knowing who she is, over the phone. Only later, we learned that during that time that this guy was courting my friend, he actually had already three girlfriends. One from Hope Christian High School, my friend. The second was from St. Stephen High School. The third was from Chiang Kai-shek High School. So tell me now, when he told my friend, I love you, did he really mean it in his heart? In the same way, when you confess to Jesus Christ as your Lord, when you have faith in Him, when you call on His name as Lord and Savior, did you really mean it in your heart so that such that you would be willing to die for this wonderful Savior? The word call here, call on His name, means allegiance, to have allegiance. Paul also revealed that we also have to believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead. 
and you will be saved. This is in relation to verse 7 when it says that I have to be good enough to bring Christ up from the dead. It is to acknowledge that God has already done that. God is the one who raised Jesus from the dead. So stop striving to do it yourself. It also points to the purpose and accomplished purpose of Christ's death on the cross. That we believe that God raised Him up from the dead victorious over their plan of paying for the penalty of our sins. His resurrection points to His victory in attaining righteousness and salvation for us. That is what we are confessing when we say we believe God raised Him from the dead. That God, that the death of Christ was actually sufficient to pay for my sins and He is victorious over sin and death. And because of this, what is the result of our faith in Christ Jesus? We are saved and we are justified according to verse 9, 10, and 13. And we obtain righteousness. The righteousness of Jesus Christ is now passed on to us such that one day when you face God, we are still sinners and yet God sees the righteousness of Christ which is passed on to us. Also, according to verse 11 and verse 33, we will not be put to shame. And according to verse 12, we are richly blessed. My friends, what a wonderful thing it is to simply believe and have faith in Christ Jesus and therefore attaining salvation, righteousness, and all the blessings of God. So again, God has established a righteousness that can only be found by simply having faith in Christ Jesus. But the Israelites rejected this established rule of God, this righteousness from Jesus Christ. In fact, they sought to establish their own through doing good works by obedience to the law. And the Gentiles simply believe and therefore they obtain this righteousness from God which is found in Christ Jesus. How does this apply in our context? Are we like the Jews? Do we reject God's only solution or God's only way for our sin problem? Do we reject Christ, the way, the truth, and the life? that no one goes through the Father except through Him? Do we insist on inventing our own way of salvation? Maybe by going to church regularly or by donating a large sum of money to the poor? The Bible is very clear. Not by works, so let no one boast. Are we zealous without knowledge or revealed truth of God? We look at the Buddhists, we look at the Catholics, and actually some ordinary ignorant Christians who goes to church zealously, and yet we see them act, acting ignorantly because they have not known the revealed truth of God, the knowledge that comes from His Word, simply because they refuse to go deep into their knowledge of the Word of God. They refuse to attend Bible studies. What they want is simply just to attend church and to listen to sermons while texting, while serving the net. Are we like the Jews who are zealous and yet misinformed? Well, the results may be catastrophic. We will not be saved. We will be put to shame. We will stumble. We fall. We do not have justification. We don't have righteousness from God. And because of this, Paul looks at his fellow Israelites, fellow Jews, and felt sad for them. He says in chapter 10, verse 1, 
my brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved to the point that earlier in chapter 9 he tells that how I wish that I would lose my salvation so that they may gain their salvation. As a pastor, I've seen a lot of zealous people serving God and yet I know that their zealousness amounts to nothing. Their donations of cash actually amounts to nothing. Why? Because they are serving the wrong God or they are serving God in the wrong way, in the wrong rules. They're thinking that by doing a lot of good works, they may please God to accept them. Well, God's rule is very simple. To all, to everyone, to anyone who would simply call on Christ Jesus with their hearts, believing that He is indeed Lord and God raised Him up from the dead, victorious over our sins and death we will receive the righteousness of Christ and therefore we are saved. As a conclusion, allow me to share to you my encounter with Oscar. Our church member, Betty, requested an immediate uh, visitation to her old classmate, Oscar. And so we set the date and um, on that day, I picked Betty up and we drove to Cavite, uh, where Oscar lived. Along the way, um, Betty uh, relayed to me the story of Oscar. Oscar was an OFW engineer working uh, in the Middle East. Uh, and he's about 60 plus years old now. And uh, he needs to come home to be treated of his cancer, which has already spread and developed into stage 4 cancer. And so she relayed to me that the doctor um, is giving Oscar about a couple of months more to live. When we arrived in Cavite, we went to the house. We saw Oscar outside his house uh, in the garden. When Oscar saw us, he said, Oi, Betty! And as he came to us walking on a cane, he looks frail. He looks very weak. And Betty told him, Oscar, how are you? I brought my pastor. And suddenly you would see the face of Oscar changing. He looked at Betty and said, Pastor? Nagdala ka ng pastor? You brought a pastor here? And I said, uh, it, It's okay. We're here to pray for you. And so as we went in and sat on the sala, uh, Oscar began telling me, you know why I've been telling Betty here that she would never convert me as a Catholic? Um, and he relayed to me this story. He said, I had cancer for the last two years. And I have actually flatlined many times. And the doctor resuscitated me every time. You know what happened the last time I was resuscitated? He told me that as he was laying on his bed in the hospital and he flatlined he said he vividly saw the doctors and the nurses frantically running around and trying to revive him and as they were running around he said he saw suddenly he saw a figure seated beside him as he laid on the bed wearing a cloak white cloak and he tried to look at the face of that person. He, he said, it's a beautiful girl, but he couldn't really see the face. And as he was trying to look at the face, suddenly that girl grabbed his hand, grabbed his hand, and that is the exact moment the doctors were able to revive him. And he looked at me and said, who do you think that person is, that girl who touched my hand and I was revived? Deep within me, of course, I knew who he was referring to. Uh, and he told me, that was Mary. You see, I've been a devoted Marian follower all these years. I have been going to church every week. Every Wednesday, I would go to Baklaran Church. 
and I would pray to God. As he finished the story, I was worried inside. How could you go against that kind of an experience? And so I shot an arrow prayer uh, to God and said, Lord, please give me wisdom. And so I told him, um, you know what? Um, you say you believe in Mary. Well, we also, we Christians, we also believe in Mary. The Bible does mention Mary. And the Bible tells us she's a good person. She's blessed by God. In fact, she was chosen to be the mother of Jesus Christ. And he was shocked to learn from the mouth of a pastor saying that Christians believe in Mary. And I said, that's what the Bible said. And so I was able to develop a rapport, a common ground with him. And so I asked him, do you believe that it is right to worship Mary? And he said, oh no, I don't worship Mary. And I disagree with some Catholics there who are worshiping Mary. We should never worship Mary and we should only worship God. And I said, that's right. So we have the same thinking about Mary. But do you know that the Bible also revealed that Jesus is the only mediator between God and man, that we should not be praying to anyone else, not to the saints, not to Mary. And so I spent the next hour or so explaining in detail the gospel according to the Bible, according to God. I explained to him our depravity as sinners and we can do nothing to save ourselves. And so I explained to him that we need Jesus Christ, God's only established way of righteousness. After an hour or two, we prayed for Oscar, hoping that he understood and accept Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. After praying for him, we left. And after a week or two, we received a call from the United States from the sister of Oscar, who is a Christian. And she was so happy to hear that a pastor finally came to visit Oscar and to pray for him and to share the gospel to him. You see, this sister has been praying for years that Oscar would hear the gospel and accept Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. After about two months, Oscar indeed passed away. My friends, I don't know if Oscar has indeed understood the gospel. I did my best presenting everything to him, but I don't know if he really got to accept Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior while he was still alive. Now, it would break my heart it would really make me very sad to one day find out if I go to heaven and I don't find Oscar there. My friends, he has been so zealous serving God. I believe he has done so much in the name of his God. And yet, if it is not done according to the established rule of God, it's all for nothing. Our zealousness amounts to nothing so near and yet so far let's pray most gracious heavenly father we give thee thanks for your graciousness and your mercy that you have revealed to us in your word that though we are sinners you have not left us to face your wrath instead you have established another way of righteousness which is only now found in your son christ jesus dying for our sins paying for the penalty of our sins therefore justifying your demand for justice and so we give thee thanks for a very simple act of believing in our hearts that jesus christ indeed died for our sins and resurrected as a sign of victory over death by believing in your son jesus christ as our lord as the lord of our lives we attain righteousness from god and so we give you thanks 
for this wonderful truth presented to us that we may receive your Son, Christ Jesus, and have fellowship once again with you. We give you thanks. All this pray in Jesus' most holy name. Pagpalang araw po sa bawat isa, ako po si Paso Eduardo Misa, uh, may asawa at may tatlong anak, isang emuji worker na sinuportahan ng United Evangelical Church of Green Hills mula pa noong 2013 hanggang sa kasulukuyan. Taong 1996 nang makilala ko ang Panginoon at pinagkalooban niya ako ng pagkakataon na makasali sa mission work Noong aming church ay mayroong church planting partnership taong 1999. But after two years, hindi po kami pinagkalooban ng Panginoon na establish church sa partnership na yon. Kung kaya't ako'y nagpasya na ipagpatuloy ang naiwang gawain habang ako'y namamasukan upang mapunan ang pangailangan ng aking pamilya. Pagkatapos ng limang taon, ay dumanas po ako ng pagsubok sa aking paglilingkod sa Panginoon nang magsakit ang aking may bahay ng malubhang karamdaman at nagsasara ang kumpanya na aking pinapasukan at ang aking bahay, ang aming kirahan ay nakatakdang idimulis sa panahong iyon. Kung gaya't marugdob akong nanalangin dumulog sa Panginoon hanggang sa hindi ko makayanan ang bigat ng pagsubok sa panahon yon at kami nagpasya na ipa-affiliate ang gawain sa Payatas Dam site doon sa isang church na nagangalang Jesus Christ the way of life sa pungmuno ni Pastor Minsurado. Taong 2011 ay sobrang lungkot ang aming naramdaman sapagat hindi kami nasanay na hindi gumagawa. Naging, naging bahagi na naming buhay ang pumunta sa mga mahirap na komunidad upang ibahagi ang salita ng Panginoon. At ito po ay napakalaking uh, kalungkutan sa aming buhay sa panahong yun. Kung kaya kami nanalangin sa Panginoon at humingi kami ng isa pang pagkakataon kung kaluban ng Panginoon na kami ay makapagsimula muli ng maliit na gawain. Isang araw ay may bumisita sa akin ng MUG staff at Inayahan akong i-observe ang kanilang uh, ministry, ang House Church Movement Ministry. At sa biyaya ng Panginoon, nakapagpasya kami na, na magsimulang muli sapagat pinapalakas nila kami upang uh, magsimula ng gawain para sa Panginoon. At yun pong panahon yun, doon ko po na meet ang United Evangelical Church na siyang sumuporta sa amin sa aming pagsisimula. Kaya salamat sa Panginoon, pinagaling niya ang aking asawa at niluob niya na makalipat kami dito sa Teresa Rizal upang dito kami magsimula ng gawain ng Panginoon. Salamat sa mabungang gawain sapagkat siya at naniniwala kami na siya ang nagkakaluob sa amin ng mga katuwang upang may sagawa ang kanyang kaluban sa lugar na ito. Ang panalangin ko, patuloy niya kayong pagpalain at madatnan niya tayong uh, gumagawa sa kanyang ubasan, sa kanyang muling pagbabalik. Sa kanya lamang, ang mataas na papuri at salamat at pagpapalain po tayong lahat. And now receive God's blessing. May the love of God the Father, which He demonstrated by sending His Son, Christ Jesus, to die for our sins while we were yet sinners and the glorious riches found in Christ Jesus to all who would believe and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit which brings peace beyond all understanding be unto you until the day of His coming and all God's people say Amen and Amen. Hi, I'm Pastor Jeanette Shua, and 
I'm very excited to be the guest speaker at UECG's special event on November 28, 8 p.m. My topic is Anxiety in Uncertain Times. I'm going to share practical tips on how to overcome anxiety and at the same time, how do we deal with the anxiety amidst this pandemic? Hope to see you there.